getting a lot of questions about hormones. So we're gonna actually do a little bit of a hormone theme. So what's the deal with cortisol? We know it's a hormone secreted by our adrenal glands, which actually are two glands that sit on top of our kidneys and are comprised of both a medulla and a cortex. The cortex is where all the magic happens. That's the outer portion of our adrenal glands. It's actually where the glucocorticoids are activated by the hypothalamus pituitary gland or the HP axis and the mineral corticoids, which are secreted in response to mechanisms found in our kidneys. We also have some activation of sex hormones there as well, but these are generally overshadowed by our ovaries if we're women and by our testes if we're men. So back to cortisol. We know it's secreted as well as aldosterone, which has some blood pressure impact. The medulla is the inner aspect of the gland, and this is where norepinephrine and epinephrine are secreted. These are important hormones, but they are still not as important as some of the other hormones that I just mentioned. They're not the frontline hormones when we're thinking about adrenals and the stress response, but they are absolutely important. And after many years of working in cardiology and ER medicine, they're absolutely critical when we're dealing with life-threatening situations. So back to cortisol. Cortisol typically follows the pattern of daytime circadian rhythm. So in an ideal circumstance, our circadian rhythms are going to be waking us up in the morning. That's when cortisol is highest. It ebbs and flows throughout the day and then it's lowest in the evening, ideally. Its primary job is to raise blood sugar and blood pressure in response to situational awareness. As I always say, you know, being chased by a saber tooth tiger, this is when cortisol and aldosterone are really going to be primed and ready. We also know that cortisol in particular also raises inflammation. It impacts digestion, as I mentioned, blood pressure, sleep quality, physical activity, stress, and craving. So if you think about it in a constellation of symptoms, it really does impact our bodies from head to toe. We know it's intricately coordinated with the HP axis, as, I rem as I've already mentioned. And if you've watched other videos of mine, we talk about how important it is to, to really support our brain and support the stress response. We know with age and increased stress, there can be more cortisol resistance and this can actually accelerate aging. So when women are in perimenopause and menopause or men are in andropause, we might not deal with stress quite as well. We know that stress raises cortisol as well as DHEA, which is that hormone that kind of works in opposition to cortisol, sex hormones like testosterone, but it also lowers things like growth hormone, melatonin, hello sleep problems, thyroid hormones, as well as estrogen and progesterone. So when we're really looking at cortisol, we want to identify issues that can give us signs about whether or not cortisol is working at our disadvantage. So I look at things like weight gain resistance. So if someone's really struggling with weight loss, poor quality sleep almost always has a component that is specific to cortisol levels that are dysregulated. Pre-diabetes or insulin resistance. When I look at type three diabetes like Alzheimer's dementia, as well as bone loss or osteopenia, which is when our bones aren't quite as strong. So how do we address this? I always recommend things like meditation that we know will tap into the parasympathetic or the rest and repose side of our brains. Really important to get off electronics earlier, wearing blue blockers in the evening, which I should be wearing, but I'm not because I'm taping. Limiting alcohol, which we know lowers both melatonin, our sleep hormone, and impacts cortisol non-beneficially. Using apps like HeartMath that demonstrate heart rate variability has been shown to lower cortisol by more than 20%. So that's an easy thing that you can put on your phone, wear your blue blockers, and a way that you can kind of see how well your body is adapting to stress. We talk about things like releasing oxytocin, so hugging your spouse, your kids, your dog, having sexual intercourse, or even having an orgasm can release oxytocin. And then adding in things last, like Serifos, which is one of my favorite supplements, L-theanine or rhodiola are all really beneficial. Serifos um, can help support cortisol in a beneficial way. L-theanine is amino acid and rhodiola is an adaptogenic herbs. Last but not least, it's also important to consider having labs drawn or also consider Dutch testing, which is dried urine and saliva. I would be at a loss if I didn't mention changing your diet. If you're eating a standard American diet, you gotta ditch it. You need to focus on protein and healthy fats, eating carbs if earned, and if you're you know, getting off of highly processed sweets, 
breads, pasta, and rice. And if you're perimenopausal, the five to seven years preceding menopause or menopause, depending on your stress management, portions of carbs can become critical, meaning you may not be able to have a large portion of a sweet potato or rice. You may have to really get by with a third of a cup, half a cup, quarter cup, and you wanna exercise smart. We don't wanna drive cortisol higher. So things like yoga, Pilates, solid core, walking in nature, grounding work, Tai Chi, versus CrossFit or more intense chronic cardio is really the way to ensure that you can better balance cortisol and your stress response.